Hello everyone and welcome to the second lectures in the Brady Rizmiel topic and today as we mentioned in the last lecture that you are going to have two specifically dedicated lectures to the two types of Brady Rizmiel, the sinus node dysfunction and the AV blobs and today we are starting with the sinus node dysfunction. Our ILO today is to learn the different clinical presentations of sinus node dysfunction and to learn how to diagnose each form of them. And of course, as we mentioned in the first lecture, that we are not talking here about the indications of pacing in this lecture as we are not covering the management in the ER or the management in the long term. And so we are focusing on the ACG diagnosis of these types of sinus node dysfunction. As we know, sinus node dysfunction is one of the main types of bradyrrhythmia, and its other name is a sick sinus syndrome, which is a classic term, but the, most prefer the more preferred term is sinus node dysfunction. And we mentioned in the first lecture that regarding the etiology of sinus node dysfunction, that don't forget to exclude secondary causes at first of sinus node dysfunction, like for example the iatrogenic causes, chronic artery disease, high vagal tone in athletes during sleep, hypothyroidism, vasovagal syncope, Cushing reflex, or severe hyperkalemia and if all these causes are excluded because some of them may be reversible at the time we can diagnose sinus node dysfunction as degenerative pathology which is the most common cause of sinus node dysfunction and so we are covering here four clinical presentations of sinus node dysfunction because it is a broad term to mention that this patient has sinus node dysfunction and we need to specify which clinical presentation do we mean sinus bradycardia, sinus poses, tachypragia syndrome, or chronotropic incontinence, which is diagnosed by treadmill rather than surface ECG. Let's start with sinus bradycardia. Of course, sinus bradycardia is one of the easiest ECG diagnoses to understand. Sinus bradycardia, as the same with sinus node dysfunction, it may be primary or due to degenerative pathology in the SNO itself, or due to secondary causes, as we mentioned before. And sinus bradycardia is very easy to understand. The SA node is still working, but it is slowed down in pacing the heart. And so the heart rate of the SA node is below 60 p per minute. So here I don't have a problem that is causing, for example, a pause in the SA node, but the SA node is slightly lazy. And so the heart rate drops below 60 p per minute. And so we can expect the criteria of sinus bradycardia in the ECG. I would expect that I would see persistent P wave with normal axis and morphology, and then it seems reasonable because, of course, the P wave originates from the SA node. So I expect that they have normal morphology, uh, apart from if the patient, for example, has atrial enlargement. But in case that the patient has no structural heart disease, so I would expect that the P wave would have normal morphology and normal duration, and also the axis would be normal. It would be positive in inferior leads, negative. In ABR and it will be negative or biphasic in V1 as we under, uh, explained before in the lecture of ECG axis. Heart rate of course would be less than 6 feet per minute, it would be regular and of course it would show one-to-one -one AV relationship provided that the AV node is intact. At the time I could call this ECG as we see here just sinus bradycardia. So, this ECG, as we see here, is another example for sinus bradycardia, in which we should see the 12 lead ECG in order to decide it is sinus bradycardia. As we can see here, it is normal axis of P wave, it is positive in inferior leads, negative in EVR, and of course, it is predominantly negative in V1 as well, and so we can call this sinus bradycardia. Let's move to the second type of sinus node dysfunction, which is sinus poses. Of course, from its term, the term is explaining itself. There is like intermittent pose and SA node function. So rather than the sinus bradycardia, in which the SA node was working continuously, but at a slow rate, here the SA node suddenly, intermittently stop its pacing. And so I can see like a pose in the ECG, in which I can see P wave, complex T wave, and then there is a pause, there is no electrical activity, apart if there is any, for example, skip rhythm appears, and then the SA node resumes its function. So here we can call this sinus pause. And in order to be accurate in our description, I need to measure the length of sinus pose in order that if I comment on an ECG or for example on Walter ECG, I need to mention how long was the sinus pose. So in order to be accurate in measuring the length of sinus pose, the distance of sinus pose is from the last P wave before the interval to the first appearing P wave in millisecond. So the sinus pose is actually the PP interval. And so for example here, I could expect the sinus pose, I am measuring it from the preceding P wave 
to the first appearing P wave. So this is the whole duration of the sinus pose in this example. So remember, of course, that sinus poses are considered clinically significant if they are more than or equal to 3 second duration. At that time, I consider them that they are clinically significant and I should assess the symptoms of the patients. And according to the guidelines, of course, they have specific management regarding whether they are producing symptoms or not in order to decide whether this patient would need correcting the reversible causes, for example, if he's taking great controlling medication or he may need pacing. But of course, we are not speaking today about this item. We have two famous terminologies which are famous to us, which are the sinus arrest and sinus exit block, which are considered two subtypes of the sinus poses. Although some consider them the same, but they are not actually the same. So what's the difference between sinus arrest and sinus exit block? Sinus arrest here in the first example, as we see, the SA node is doing its function properly and pacing the heart at a normal heart rate. But the problem is that it stops its function temporarily causing something like a sinus arrest for a limited duration of time and then it resumes its function again and pays the heart a normal rate. So here we can expect that the patient has temporary stoppage of that SA nodal function and so we call this sinus arrest. In the second example here, the SA node is doing its function properly and pacing the heart at a normal rate. But the problem is that some of the impulse failed to get out from the SA node because some literature explain this by presence of a tough capsule so sometimes the impulse fail to get out of the SA node to pay the atria and so here we can call this sinus exit block it is not a sinus arrest because the SA node is still working but the problem is that the impulse are trapped here and cannot get out to pay the atrium and so it is called sinus exit block and then this condition of course is temporary and the heart resumes its function again and so, how can we differentiate them in the ECG? Of course, because sinus exit block, the SA node was still working, but the problem is that some impulse couldn't get out. At that time, the sinus pose is a direct or an accurate multiplication of the resting PP interval, for example, twice, three times, or four times the resting PP interval. Whereas in sinus arrest, the sinus pose is not an accurate multiplication of the resting PP interval, because in the sinus arrest, the SA node stopped its function temporarily, and then it resumes again, so the sinus pose could maybe an accurate multiplication, but in most of the cases, it is not an accurate multiplication of the resting PP interval. So this is the difference between sinus arrest and sinus exit block. Of course, one of the famous mistakes in ECG diagnosis, and we explain this in the lectures of ectopics in ECG, is failure to differentiate between sinus pose and non-conducted PEC. In sinus pose, I see that there is a pose in the electroactivity of the heart, but there is no P wave superimposed or just after the T wave at the start of the pose, because here the SA node has failed to pace the heart. Whereas in non-conducted PEC, which is a physiological phenomenon that may occur in normal individuals, I could see an abnormal P wave superimposed just after the T wave, and this P wave, because it is not arising from the SA node, it is a PEC, so it is arising from an ectopic focus in the atrium, show different axis or morphology and this is present as the start of that pose let's see here in this example this arrow can show that there is like a pivot t wave here and this pivot t wave is not an abnormal t wave morphology it's just a p wave superimposed on the t wave so this is not a sinus pose although from the first instance you may diagnose this ECG that this patient has sinus pose and you are going to calculate the duration of the sinus pose, but if you focus on the T wave at the start of the pose, you would see that there is a superimposed P wave, so it is non-conducted PEC. So before diagnosis, non-conduct uh, sinus pose, please don't jump to this diagnosis before excluding non-conducted PEC. Now we are going to a famous terminology that some of us don't understand and I'm going to explain today, which is tachybrady syndrome. Here I could see in this Holter ECG an abnormal finding. I could see that sometimes the patient have sinus pose. The patient may have something like a bradyacystole. It is a long sinus pose. And then when the SA node or when the heart rate resume, the patient has an abnormal form of tachycardia, which is not sinus tachycardia. It is something like, for example, maybe atrial fibrillation, because the heart rate is regular in some of these tachycardic episodes. And sometimes it's regular, so it is not AF. Maybe it is SVT, maybe it is atrial flutter. So what can we call this and what's going on here? And here's the same. I could see, for example, here that the patient sometimes have sinus bradycardia, and sometimes he have sinus poses, and sometimes he have an episode of tachycardia, which seems to be regular, so he may be SVT or atrial flutter. So what's going on here? So we need to understand this 
the explanation for this in order to understand what's meant by tachybrady syndrome. The problem in this patient is that the patient has pulse of sinus bradycardia or escape rhythm and sometimes poses alternating with pulse of atrial fibrillation or flutter with rapid ventricular rate. So why this occurs? The problem is that the SE node here has a, some sort of dysfunction and so for example it paces the heart at a slow weight and sometimes it loses its control of the heart and when it loses its control of the heart an abnormal circuit for example may arise in the right atrium giving rise to atrial flutter which is a re-entrant circuit and sometimes the patient may develop multiple smaller re-entrant circuits inside the left atrium for example causing atrial fibrillation so the patient with the SA node loses its control of the heart abnormal rhythm arise in the atria like atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter and and then the SA node may resumes its function again leading to resumption of sinus bradycardia that may occur or sometimes it fails to pace the heart and the patient may develop escape juncture rhythm or escape into ventricular rhythm. So what we can say is that the patient has bouts of bradycardia which may be sinus bradycardia or maybe sometimes escape rhythm alternating with bouts of tachycardia that may be atrial fibrillation with a red ventricular rate or atrial flutter. So this is what we call tachybrady syndrome. And so this form reflects s nodal dysfunction because it cannot do its function as a normal pacemaker of the heart. It is not the leader of the heart anymore. And so this leads some, some like some chaos inside the heart, leading to this pulse of tachycardia alternating with bradycardia. And that's why that you need to focus in the ECG, not just because you see atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, so this patient has a tachyarrhythmia. If you see a longer strep, or for example, if you record the Holter ECG, you may notice that this patient has sinus bradycardia almost most of the time, and his average heart rate, for example, is below 60. So I should suspect this clinical entity as tachycardia tachybrady syndrome and so tachybrady is a form of sinus node dysfunction and of course the issue in this category of patient is that you cannot give them recontrolling medication for the AF or flutter because if you give them recontrolling medication in this case at the time the patient may develop more sinus node dysfunction that he may develop severe sinus bradycardia he may develop severe bradycardic escape rhythm. He may have a sinus pose that may be prolonged and may not recover again. And so, in this patient, I need to revise his rate controlling medication. If he's taking rate controlling medication, it needs to be reduced or stopped even. And some of these patients may need, of course, permanent pacemaker. So this is a very important diagnosis to consider. Now we are focusing on the last type of sinus node dysfunction, which is called chronotropic incompetence. The difference in this type is that it is not diagnosed from resting ECG because this patient has normal resting ECG. Maybe he shows sinus bradycardia, but in many cases the patient has normal resting ECG and you cannot notice that there is any abnormality in it. But this abnormality appears when you subject this patient to a treadmill test. Because in the treadmill test, you need the patient to reach 80% of his age predicted maximum heart rate. He fails to reach this 80%. I think we need to explain much more about this chronotropic incompetence. First of all, the age predicted maximum heart rate is calculated by subtracting the age from 220. So for example, if a patient is 40 years old, so his age predicted maximum heart rate should be 180 beat per minute. So normally he should reach 80% of this age predicted maximum heart rate. In order to make like a uniform criteria to diagnose the chronotropic incompetence, there is something called chronotropic response index, CRI, which is a measure of the maximum heart rate that the patient can achieve in relation to his chronotropic reserve. How can we calculate it? It is very easy. Just during the treadmill test, I subtract the resting heart rate from the maximum achieved heart rate that the patient could reach, and I will divide this by the subtraction of age predicted maximum heart rate minus the resting heart rate. So what I mean that I see how much or what is the maximum rate that the patient could reach and I put this in relation to his age predicted maximum heart rate that is the rate that is expected to reach because of his age and according to this formula I could reach whether the patient has a good chronotropic response index so he has good chronotropic reserve or the patient has a low chronotropic response index and so he has chronotropic incompetence. The value for this or the normal value is that the chronotropic uh, response index should be more than 0.8%. It means that he should reach 80% of his age predicted maximum heart rate and if he is in beta blockers at that time he should reach 0.62. So if the chronotropic response index is below these set values at the time I could consider that this patient has chronotropic 
incompetence. So what, this, what does this patient feel? The patient at rest doesn't feel anything. His only problem is with exertion or sometimes with stressful situations that he may feel dizziness, lightheadedness, easy fatigability, dyspnea, or sometimes blackout. And when I perform a treadmill test, I could calculate the chronotropic response index, which is below 0.8%, and it is very easy to calculate. So in chronotropic incompetence, the challenge for the patient is with exertion not at rest and this explain normal resting ECG. Remember of course that diagnosis of chronotropic incompetence depends on stress ECG so please don't mention that the patient has chronotropic incompetence without performing a treadmill test to confirm that these symptoms are caused by chronotropic incompetence. Don't just assume that if the patient mentioned to you that I have some dizziness when I'm going upstairs or, or I'm going or I'm running for example or walking the time you tell him that you have chronotropic incompetence without performing a treadmill test. So at the end of our lecture here, now we understand the clinical presentation of sinus node dysfunction and how to diagnose each one of them. Today we explain sinus bradycardia, sinus poses, tachypradia syndrome, and chronotropic incontinence. And of course, our take-home message today, we should exclude secondary causes of sinus node dysfunction before managing it as a degenerative etiology because some of these causes may be reversible and may be correctable. And of course, before jumping to a diagnosis of sinus pose, excludes a non-conducted PEC. Thank you very much for listening, and we are waiting for you for the next lecture regarding AV blocks.